They swear to Welcome back to another episode of these crazy people that just eat meat and can't stop talking about it. It's Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And um, it's just me and Justin today. Uh, Joe's got a new work schedule. Emily's busy doing her stuff. And Raymond, well, you know Raymond. Him and his six packs are on their way to Hollywood, so he doesn't have time for us. It's Father's Day. I'm sure he's spending time with his family. Oh, that's right. So, what's our uh, big topic today there, Justerino? Yeah, so today I came across a, a Facebook post of someone talking about butyrate. Um, and they were getting the impression that the only way to get or manufacture butyrate for the body to produce it was through the fermentation of plant foods. And I was like, hold up. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is like one of those things is like, not that it's so wrong, because it's not that they're wrong, but just, just because you see the evidence for a thing doesn't mean that's the only way for the body to accomplish that process. So for instance, um, you know, uh, inflammation that's positive, hermesis, things of that nature, right? We talk about this quite a bit. That's kind of the last vestige of why you need plants in your diet. If you've already convinced them on the anti-nutrients, if you've convinced them on plant toxins, if you've convinced them on how they're not bioavailable, like the last thing they'll try to hit you with or think about is, oh, the hermesis, you need the positive inflammation is the way that I describe it. And it's actually, no, you can get that, you know, heat exposure, cold exposure, exercise, what have you, and get the same effect, if not better or similar. And so, yeah, it's just kind of one of those things. And I think what happens is with the ideology of being more plant-based, plants being good for you, having being so steeped in uh, the medical field, it's so much easier to study plants than it is to study meat because they're already seen as good. So if you're going by any research board um, and you say, hey, I want to see what happens if we, you know, when we ferment carrots, spinach, broccoli in someone's gut, they'll be like, oh, cool. Yeah, let's go for it, you know. But if you're like, hey, I want to see the processes of only eating meat <laughs> in the gut, they'll be like, wait, hold up. We're going to have these cardiovascular issues. You'll be causing, might increase your chances of cancer, what have you, right? Based on all this other bad research. And so I think that's one area is, or issue is just that the way the research itself is geared. So even if, and you were telling me about how you experienced this talk, when trying to even research this topic, it said you just kept running into plant-based articles if you want to speak on that. Yeah, so uh, when I saw what you saw, you shared it with me. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. They make it sound like the only way to get these short-chain fatty acids is by eating plants, right? So you eat the plants, they ferment in your colon, or you got to eat fermented food. You know, and it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Red meat has short chain fatty acids in it. So I start looking it up and I'm like, foods containing short chain fatty acids. And it's all the vast majority of it was plant based. Like, oh, you eat some lentils, you know, and they ferment in your colon and that's where you get them, you know, and colon cells needing all, uh, you know, these short chain fatty acids to to survive and on and on and on. And then in between all those articles, you would see see like foods containing, you know, short chain chatty acids, fatty acids, chatty acids. So I don't have to add that to the list. Chatty acids, <laughs> uh, chatty acids uh, like uh, butyrate. I'm pretty sure uh, butter is loaded with butyrate, and I'm pretty sure butyrate got named after butter. So we could just start there, but also 
I should have I should have put the list of the short chain fatty acids that are real common. But butyrate, acetate, and propionate. Those I think those are the three most common ones. And uh, you know, butyrate. I don't know how how the plant based people miss the fact that beta hydroxybutyrate or the ketone that we measure is butyrate. I don't understand that. So um, your your body will produce a fair amount of butyrate. It's not the most prevalent fatty acid chain, but it's one of the ones that we commonly measure. And it's one of the ones most commonly associated with reducing inflammation and mental clarity and mood stability and stuff like that. And that that's where we get the ketogenic diet, which is very popular, you know, very, very popular pillar in the low carb community. So anyways, yeah, this, there's this whole sort of, um, I'm not sure what you call it, paradigm of shifting the, the language about short fat, uh, chatty acids, short chatty chain acids. fatty acids to the plant-based, um, the plant-based uh, sort of concepts. Right. And I think my, my gut feeling is that the, the whole point is, it's a setup by the way, gut feeling, my gut feeling uh, is uh, that uh, the, uh, the whole point of this is uh, for plant-based folks to, um, to start gaining acceptance with their flatulence. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's yeah. healthy, right? Because it's the, uh, the butyrate right. buildup. Mm. You got some fermentation going on. You got some chemical processes. Yeah. But that's just my gut feeling. <laughs> well, yeah. And then, of course, you know, lard, all the animal fats, you, you will create butyrate with, you know. Uh, there yeah. without fermenting in your gut, you you can, you don't have to even eat butter <laughs> to get it. You yeah. know, you can in fact eat nothing and get it. Actually, yeah. um, you know, it's just that that's not sustainable. Well, unless you're a breatharian, but we're not talking to those people. But anyway, um, you know, not eating for years is not sustainable, and so. Um, the carnivore diet is is the closest thing you're going to get your butyrate you're going to get all the other short chain fatty acids plus the bioavailable nutrients etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh you shouldn't have things fermenting in your uh in your colon it's not not good for you it causes uh di possibly diverticulitis um crohn's not to mention intestinal distress of all kind leaky gut or gut wall impairment and uh ability which sometimes suspected to having autoimmune issues once that wall is disrupted yeah so it, it is kind of interesting um you know it's kind of like this a magic trick of keep your eye on the left hand and don't look at the right hand right yeah and i think it's another case of just we zoom out we see that a lot of these things that are not normal have been normalized right it's just a matter of well you know uh, indigestion bloating heartburn <laughs> you know diarrhea all that stuff is 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 normalized right it's like oh it's just part of life it's just part of getting old you know it's just part of eating it's just part of but you know what we got remedies for that so we're going to sell you a bunch of cheap crops that are loaded with pesticides. And here's another point, you know, with all the concern about being exposed to pesticides, something like 98% of all the pesticides that we're exposed to are naturally occurring pesticides in the plants. They're not, they're not pesticides that were sprayed on the crops. There are pesticides that the plants manufacture as natural defense mechanisms. Yeah, my aunt uh, loves Brussels sprouts. I don't know how, but she loves Brussels sprouts. And um, I think she just boils them in butter or something. I don't know. So maybe she loves the butter. Maybe she doesn't love the Brussels sprouts. 
And I saw a post. Now, I didn't fact check this, but it's from a reputable page, reputable source. It said Brussels sprouts have like 169 known carcinogens in them. Yeah. And then like button, button mushrooms, I think, had like 108. Um, and I sent that to my aunt and she was like, damn it. I love Brussels sprouts and mushrooms. So it was just kind of funny. Well, you know, at her a little bit. I've been after my Congress person to start a bill. And, uh, ba- the gist of it is that we're going to ship all the Brussels sprouts to Brussels and let them deal with it. <laughs> there you go. I fully support that. I don't understand why people don't like Brussels sprouts because like broccoli they smell like garbage <laughs> they smell like a hot trash can that's full of lawn clippings so I don't know why anybody wants to eat that well it, like I said it's the joke vegetable it's a joke vegetable Brussels, it's a joke vegetable and it's kind of you weird because it's really a cluster of leaves that grows on a branch right I guess I don't know. I don't, I don't know where they come from. I've avoided them like my entire life. It's the mini version of a. Oh, hell, what are those things called? They're. It's like a cluster of leaves. Artichoke. It's like the mini version uh, of an artichoke. And artichokes, I mean, I get it. Some people like them, but last time I had an artichoke, it tasted like a fucking swamp. I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been big on artichokes. Like, I think there was like an artichoke pizza I had once, and it was good, blended with the other stuff. But artichoke dip, that was pretty good. Um, I mean, yeah, you're basically like... scraping the soft, scummy part off of a leaf. <laughs> Just saying. Well, you know, these are these are what's funny about them is Brussels sprouts. Maybe not Brussels sprouts, but artichoke for sure. And asparagus are kind of like hoity-toity vegetables. Like them's, them's rich people vegetables. You know what I mean? Like if you go to a restaurant and you can order uh, either artichoke part of the side or like an artichoke dip. Or if you can order, um, what did I just say? What are they called? Um, Artichokes, it's Brussels sprouts. Brussels, the other one, the third one. Broccoli. I just said it. No, it oh, was asparagus. Asparagus. Yeah, if you can order like asparagus as a side, like grilled asparagus with a little bit of oil, that's a fancy restaurant typically. I mean, it's it's got to have at least two dollar signs on Yelp. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, I know in Germany, like the way. No white Brussels or asparagus is like a quite the delicacy. And I know some guy was selling on like a roadside stand and his price was too high and they got beat up. So I tried to murder him. So I don't think people should feel that strongly about vegetables. Yeah, pr- probably not. Well, I mean, you know, you're in California, avocado toast, right? Is, is a thing, like it a legit the- thing. But it's like, hey, if you're, if you're doing well, you can have avocado toast for breakfast. Well, and I get like an avocados because avocado, a great avocado, it it's an awful like green butter. You know, it's like it's buttery, right? Right. But you know, and I used to eat asparagus. I used to grill asparagus on the grill and stuff, base it down. It was all right, but. You know, looking back on it, none of that's near as enjoyable as a as a cheap piece of steak. None of it. Right. They're, they're not even. They don't even come close to being as good as a crappy piece of bologna or a hot dog or something. And now, course, for those at home, I am still here. I'm just tending toward to my my uh, pork uh, shoulder cuts, so I can still talk. I'm not disappeared. He's not disappeared. He's I'm not disappeared. At least here in voice form. Yes. Timing, it just so happened. Yeah. Anyway, didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted Far to explain out, for our people that are are watching later at home. Yeah. So, anyways, not too surprisingly, you see a discussion come up about short change fatty acids 
or short chain chatty asses. And then um, naturally everything gets steered towards plant based diets. Everything gets steered towards having a car accident in your kitchen, apparently. Yeah. We're okay. We're, we're, we're doing it. We're okay. So, yeah, and we're uh, the, today we, we're, we're having this early because of Father's Day. I uh, know I've been busy. Sounds like Justin's busy cooking. Are you getting those meals prepped for the week? Is that what's going on? Yeah. I, you, I, would, I could bring the tablet over here so you see what's going on. That's why it's not. Sounds like a train wreck. <laughs> I promise you, it looks better. Sounds so like, these are. Sounds like somebody crashed their car into an abutment. So these are country style thick pork ribs. Uh, uh, they're not. They're in, made from. Not in frame. No, go down. Uh, tilt down. Tilt down. Tilt down. There you go. There you go. Looking all right. I'm going to throw some. Um, looking, looking juicy. Yeah, they are juicy, actually. I just kind of bought them on the rent whim. Didn't know how to cook them, so I had to look it up real quick. Hmm. And I'm going to throw some some uh, Primal Kitchen barbecue sauce on these and throw them in for another hour at 275. And they, should be, uh, they should be pretty good. Well, pork's, pork's tough, you know? Pork plain is just. I don't know that flavor just gets tiring so so quickly. I don't know. To me, pork needs something. I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but just well, you you bought some uh, ground beef, ground pork mix. What happened there? Yeah. So um, at first, I felt like I didn't like it, but then like I started to crave it. It was really weird. Mm. And definitely better with butter and cheese. Um, and I did experience um, some tough stools the next couple of days after eating uh, a couple of pounds of it. So, well, that could just happen with ground meat for some reason. Doesn't happen with me with with ground beef. I like um, I, in fact with ground beef, I oftentimes have the opposite problem. Not so much anymore than the beginning of carnivore. It was like, you know, I would eat even like halfway through a meal of ground beef, like ground beef and like eggs or something. And it would be like halfway through the meal. It's like off to the races, you know? Hmm. And so I was running, running to the bathroom, like for real. I think, oh, one of my biggest mistakes early carnivore was that, oh, because like, the fat and the broth is like good for you, right? And so I would drink the the fat at the bottom, yeah. and that just had me had me running <laughs> like a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, that's a little so much for, for people in the beginning sometimes. Yeah, so I had to learn to not do that. It was like, ooh, yeah, that was not not kosher, you know. Mm -hmm. So you know, these are just early mistakes. Hey, I was trying to get plenty of butyrate, all right? I think if it. Amanda Leia was here, she would she would correct you on that kosher aspect. No, it'd still be not kosher because there's like eggs and cheese and you can't mix. Well, that and it's not blessed either. So it actually is not not kosher. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure uh, pork and pork all together it wouldn't even be close. Blessed or not. So I'm yeah, it's saying. not kosher. You never know a new light's gonna a new information is gonna come to light. New information about kosher? So that was a big Lebowski uh, reference. Oh uh, whoops, I missed it. <laughs> I mean you in the kitchen sounds like the plane's about to hit the effing mountain. What? There's another uh, Big Lebowski reference, man. You are slipping. Oh, yeah. I am slipping. Sorry, I need to watch the movie again. I did watch Wolf of Wall Street last night. That's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, there's a lot going on in that one. Haven't seen that one in a while. 
Yeah. So, uh, what's your, what are you going to eat for this week? Uh, well, you're eating involved. Oh, you know, back on the vegetable thing. I mean, you know, the, the way they make things like Brussels sprouts, artichokes, and broccoli taste better is they put butter and bacon on them, you know? Yeah. Won't the world be better if they just left out the, the stupid vegetables? Oh, that'd be amazing if you could go to a restaurant and just get butter and bacon. <laughs> Oh man, that'd be so good. You can. Uh, you done over there? What? Oh, I thought I lost. Oh, it. sorry. No, I'm here. All right, it got loud and then it was silent. Oh, sorry. I forget that I'm on the Bluetooth. Sorry for those that are listening with headphones. Yeah, they. I all... promise. Next week's uh, production all, values will be higher. They all quit by now. Don't worry about it. Oh, dang. So, anyways, uh, let's see here. Um, I I like to talk about uh, what I call it the Tom Challenge. The, uh, the Tom Challenge is to go to whatever store you shop in or market or whatever. Go to the produce section. Look at any piece of produce, fruit or vegetable. And then figure out how long human beings have been eating it. Because I think in people's minds, I think we've been eating all this stuff forever. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's watermelon, bok choy, or spinach oh, bok choy that used to be a favorite of mine actually uh celery apples bananas oranges grapes pears plums whatever that stuff just didn't occur in nature you know not in the form that we eat them I, typically not even in an edible form right right well i mean so, isn't like broccoli mustard like aren't there like 30 edible plants that are from like a plant <laughs> basically well a lot of them are der derivatives of a mustard plant right so I think yeah like broccoli and kale and i forget but yeah there's something like that there's a bunch of them that are adaptations and of course you know things like carrots used to be just scraggly brown roots right they weren't actual right. big colorful sweet chewable <laughs> things they were just they were they were roots that were selected for their flavor you know they had a good flavor but they didn't really typically have much nutritional value so and then the whole thing about carrots it's like one giant fairy tale you know let me guess you're one giant a timer uh i'm setting the temperature yeah, it's great. Now I'm programming <laughs> the timer. So for a long time, it's believed that carrots were good for your eyes because they had vitamin A in them. And in World War II, I think uh, that was the British that started some propaganda. They were all of a sudden shooting down enemy fighters at a at a record rate and they they put out some propaganda saying oh they were just having all their gunners eat a lot of carrots so their eyes were better or something like that and you know I, I think it was via uh mostly who's that who's that one guy that was their big uh, that's the big propaganda agent oh B bugs bunny yeah so bugs bunny um you know, started pushing the uh, pushing the idea that eating carrots is good for your eyes. Um, what's up, Doc? And um, the carrot. We all believe that eating carrots would give you better vision, but of course, uh, is it beta carotene that's in carrots? I think it's yeah. Beta. So beta carotene, as I recall, is two vitamin A molecules or two retinol molecules that are bound together. But unfortunately. We don't absorb much of that because it's a vegetable that's full of fiber and phytic acid. And then the little bit we do absorb, 
something like 50% of people on earth cannot convert into retinol at all. And of the 50% that can convert whatever they can absorb, um, it's only somewhere between one and 50% of, of what they absorb. And the rest of it is all a waste. And it comes packaged with pesticides, natural, natural pesticides. So if you believe in nature, believe that plants naturally don't want you to eat them. And they're poisonous, unlike the flesh of tasty animals. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, right, which is just another reason. Eat the animal, put the plants down. You don't need them. Um, Yeah, I just kind of want to circle back to to butyrate. Um, And uh, I kind of made this reference because uh, I forgot who I was listening to, but someone was saying how um, you got to sometimes use their language to Mm. describe what you're doing. So someone had talked about, oh, when I put them on a keto diet, I just tell them it's a high protein uh, Mediterranean diet. And then doctors are more apt to work with me. He said, who said this? I don't remember. It was some interview. I wish I knew I'll have to dig it up, but that's weird because a keto diet is definitely not a high protein diet. (laughs) Of course, but maybe by some people's standards, it is because We've seen these studies where they talk about high fat or high protein, and it's like it's relatively low amounts by today's standards. So, and I mean, a keto diet's a high fat diet, low carbohydrate, moderate protein by by design. So, but you know what? People don't understand that. I, I get it because I talk to people all the time, like, yeah, I'm doing keto, and it's like I'm eating a lot of meat, and I'm like, well, okay then, <laughs> just let it go. Yeah, I mean, it may not have said keto. I was just done with some keto or carnivore podcast right. that I was listening to over the week. Um, and uh, I just thought that was interesting. And so in my response to that post, even though it's scientifically wrong to uh-huh. get people to kind of think in the same direction, because if you if you kind of grab the train that they're already rolling on, like yeah. it makes it easier, I feel like, right? And mm-hmm. so... I was like, you could think of us as fat fermenters, which I know is wrong, but like just for people to like get the ideas in their head in a way to like bind it to something, you know, because sometimes we can hear new concepts and they kind of float around in our head. And if we have no way to like sticky note them somewhere, like Mm -hmm. they kind of get lost or they're harder to pin down. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was like, you know, we're fat fermenters as for you know as a way to think about it i know that's scientifically incorrect but i mean well what is fermentation right it's just simply a chemical process that changes somehow the chemical compound of a biological uh agent right yeah i suppose it just matter it's just a degree of how pedantic you want to be about describing the process right right yeah yeah, and there's a couple of points I want to make real quick. Number one, acetate being a short chain fatty acid. When you're when you're in a state of ketosis or getting close to it, I mean, one of the ways you can measure your level of ketosis is by breath. Let's right. Have it here. I have one of those. I forgot what they're called, but it's a meter you blow into, you plug it into a device, and then, so anyways, it's it's actually measuring acetone in your breath. Acetone is made, is is a form of acetate, right? Mm-hmm. And so right there, aside from the beta hydroxybutyrate that we measure in our blood tests, if we're doing if we're looking for ketones, you can measure the acetone in your breath. And you know, that happens when you're on a ketogenic diet, when you're fasting, or you're just eating a lot of fat, you know, you will get the acetone in your breath. So again, there's evidence for another fatty acid that's not coming from vegetables. Yeah. Um, I mean, it totally makes sense and I get it. 
but I could see someone shooting back with, well, that's because they still have vegetables in their gut. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just saying. How many vegetables do you have in your gut? Right now, I think I have near zero, but I'm not testing my acetate either. So I'm I know, saying. but we, if we tested your breath, it probably would detect acetone. Yeah, you know probably. I'll make, I'll make a point of setting that thing up. I haven't used it in a long time because I'm not, I don't chase ketosis or anything, but I do love data, you know, and it's fun stuff. So, um, I will, I will find that meter. I'll find the, the glucose and, uh, uh, ketone meter and all that stuff. We'll do it. We'll do all that stuff in a video. It'll be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. I still got mine. I think I need new ketone strips for mine. Yeah. Mine are probably, I've never done the breath one though. Yeah, it's called a catonics or something like that. So mm -hmm. I know they've got that new one that a lot of Well, there's that whole there's that whole company built around it called Lumen. Lumen that yeah, so tells Lumen's you if you're color, fat right? burning. Yeah. Whether you're fat burning or carb burning, supposedly. What was neat about that was Sean showing him like throughout a day or a few days or something. And um he was clearly on the carb burning side. And I don't remember if it was like right before a workout or like right after a workout, yeah. but um, yeah. So for those that think, oh, you're going to be stuck in long-term ketosis or uh, long-term ketosis is bad, which I think long-term ketosis, but you have to define long-term ketosis firstly. But anyway, um, is, is bad. I think that could be harmful. But the fact is, is that no, <laughs> you're, you're just, you're not, the body's not operating that way. There are times when you're burning glucose because you have to, otherwise you'd be dead. And so eating only carnivore, you can make that machine, that device show up as you're burning carbs, even by not technically eating any right. carbohydrates. Well, you got to take, you got to understand a guy like Sean has a lot of muscle on him. I mean, it's not a, like a bulky bodybuilder guy like John Anderson, who we had on, but he is very muscular and he's very active. So um, we know as part of the process of recovering from a workout or whatever, your blood sugar goes up, and your muscles get reloaded with, um, uh, uh, what am I thinking of? Glycogen? Glycogen, yeah. It was a good you're distracting me with your gulping. You're distracting. I did it now because anyway. you were talking. I was trying to. Yeah, not could you just drink like it. a human being? Jesus. You know, a... Here, have a glass and you take a sip. Does this look like a glass to you? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a big guy like a big guy like Sean, you know, you're. The, the whole idea here is that we let our bodies make the glucose and consequently the glycogen uh, that it needs rather than, than eating a bunch of sugar and having our blood sugar uh, be out of control, you know? So, so yeah, just because, uh, you know, you show that you're, and, and, and none of these devices are that accurate. I mean, Bart did that study where he was checking the, the electronic devices that measure your your body composition, your fat to lean ratio, and all that stuff, and he showed how hydration changed mm -hmm. uh, changed the readings reliably. Uh, even with our with our uh, trackers, our, our trackers, it says you're in normal mode, fat burn mode, cardio mode, and that's all just a guess, right? It's not really it it, the, it can tell you what your heart rate is accurately. And it could probably tell you your temperature and your O2 saturation pretty accurately. But what's actually going on inside your body is going to vary from person to person. And they're really just basing it off of data. And we were talking about this because we were talking about the, the fat burner vests, you know. It's like most yeah. of the studies we see them do that. They're doing it at universities on people that are already very athletic. They're trying to get more athletic. So, you know, there isn't probably a lot of data on average people with any of these devices or methods. So, but they can be helpful, especially if you're trying to meet certain goals, you're trying to, trying to fine tune something, you know? Yeah. And, <clears throat> excuse me. 
combining both of those that you just went with the uh, electrical Com pulse combining what? What did I say? Is there a combining? Combining? It's not a word. There might be I'm an, up there might be an extra letter in there. <laughs> combining uh, those two uh, concepts together. Uh, I tested myself on my, so I do have one of those electrical impulse scales that gives you a rough estimate of your body composition. And I've been doing the cool fat burn, which will coming in another video, we'll both be wearing them, will be strapped up. Um, and a cool fat burn. I haven't I put getting, my on on yet today. I was getting I was getting frostbite on my love handles. Nice. I had to take a couple of packs out. <laughs> and uh, I, I've lost like point what was it point four point five percent body fat oh, supposedly. Yeah. I've gotten this low before doing OMAD, but I haven't been doing OMAD, and I'm still dropping. And I dropped. I dropped like 0.3 of a percent last week and I dropped another like 0.4% like this past week. Wow. Yeah, I've hardly been wearing mine. I I busted it out of the freezer when we started talking about it. Like it's, I hadn't worn it in a long time. And then I for like a week or two straight, I was putting that thing on and then I forgot about it again. So this morning I was like, ah, I got to throw this thing on. They just get so busy. I forget, forget, forget it's there. Yeah. I mean, I try to do it every day. I think I've done it nearly all day, but one the last couple of weeks. And um, hey, it's, it's showing up. I don't know if I really see body composition changes as far as physique, but <clears throat> if I continue to see a drop on that scale, I think we might be onto something or they, well, they were onto something. It says to do it for six weeks um, mm. as like a protocol. So that's what I'm trying to. And you're only for. supposed to do it for a half an hour, right? About a half hour. Yeah. I think a half hour to an hour. If you, we might I've always done an hour. We, we might've learned a little something about wearing it too long. Yeah. Getting a crypt, crypt. Well, definitely you should wear it with a shirt. I've learned that for <laughs> sure. You do not want to be going ape man. On it, unless maybe you have a lot of body hair. I don't know. Maybe that'd be fine. You but hair, you get hair suit. you get cryo burns, and uh, it's yeah. not as bad as a regular burn, but um, not comfortable. There's some tenderness still, you know. But it's not getting worse. I don't think, even though I continue to wear it. Yeah. So you know, like I said a million times, you work out at night, and I don't want to put it on after I work out because. You know, it, uh, it lowers inflammation, which is going to reduce uh, muscle building, you know. So uh, I tend to try and put it on in the morning. And then usually I'm in the morning, I'm getting ready to go to work and I'm busy and I forget. So, but I might just start throwing it on when I drive to work. But then I got to remember to put it back in the freezer when I get home. And it's probably not going to be cold enough. I don't know. So it's complicated. You should just get a big freezer in your in your uh, office and just throw it and just have it in there. You gonna, wear it at the office. I'm gonna have to. Yeah. I'll, uh, since nobody at work watches these anyways, yeah, I'll have to get like a mini freezer and hide it in my office. I was already thinking go. about getting a mini fridge. I was gonna hang steaks in there. <laughs> Dry age, dry age, dry age, and steaks at work. There you go. Yep. Just saying, hey, modern uh, problems require modern solutions. Right. Go. Yeah. So I don't know. It's the age of the mini fridge. Got to stash them all over the place. <laughs> I mean, we don't live in the ice age. You can't just, you know, hide some meat in a snowbank somewhere. Right. You can't throw your cool fat burn uh, chest piece in a cool bank somewhere. So. I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, like ice age people, they'd probably hang meat on a rope from a tree limb so the animals couldn't get it because it was cold. It was going to last. And, they, you know, they still find meat tied to sticks at the bottom of lakes. 
So like huh. people would want to preserve it. And then so they would tie it, you know, to a stick and like a leather bag or something. I don't know exactly. And then they stick the, the stake into the soil at the bottom of the, of the lake where it's really cold. And then the, the meat would last forever. So they still find those. So some of them, I have to look at it. But I haven't seen an article on it in a while, but it's pretty fascinating how people used to, you know, preserve stuff. Definitely. Well, you know, they had to come up with something, you know, we weren't, we weren't dumb. You know, that's the messed up thing is that we think us, okay, maybe 3 million years ago, but when you get certainly closer to regular, you know, us, right. Uh, Homo erectus, basically as smart as we are now, <laughs> essentially. Well, less. modern humans or something like on the order of 7,000 generations old. So you can imagine, I mean, lots of people are just naturally curious or, you know, people have time to think about things. And, you know, where, where I kind of had the realization was you think about it, 7,000 generations is a long time to figure stuff out. Right. Right. Especially for for creatures that are sort of naturally inclined to make tools and stuff like that, right? Uh, naturally curious. Uh, I like to say curiosity is is the least the least appreciated form of intelligence, right? Because when you're curious, you just learn stuff by being curious, right? Ooh, that reminds me. I heard an interesting. It's from a novel, not like a textbook or anything. This theory about monkeys, like. Well, how come monkeys aren't developing intelligences like us? And the way he put it in the book was, well, there's just not enough reward for curiosity and going out off the beaten path, so to speak, for these these other monkeys. And for whatever reason, there was a reward for us. Not sure what the reward was. I mean, we can come, we can... We can come and look, but in the moment of us doing that, what the road was for our particular ape uh, species, hard to say. But I thought that was interesting. Well, so there is no. From a nutritional standpoint, you could say, well, we're closest to ch probably chimps, right? Mm -hmm. And chimps, chimps do eat monkeys, but chimps mm -hmm. just basically eat the flesh off the monkeys. They don't smash open the brain case and eat the brains i've never seen one suck on the bone marrow out of a monkey bone so they and they don't eat i mean this still doesn't make up the majority of their diet but if you had you know semi you know somehow we developed a, a semi semi-aquatic type characteristics right so not only can we eat animals on the land but we can eat animals out of the water Right. And and you don't, you know, the other the other primates don't eat much out of the water. Right. Because they can't they can't jump in the water and hold their breath like we can. And they generally don't have much body fat, so they can't stay warm in the water. You know, so the, they generally can't do any more than like wading into it. And that's the only time they can really stand up and walk for a long period of time is when they're wading in the water. So we see those differences and we realized that, you know, as animals that make tools and got into smashing open bones and eating marrow, we not only had access to the, the protein of the animal, but we had access to, to fat and fatty acids, you know, which are prevalent, you know, if you're starting, you know, shellfish and stuff like that, um, other sea creatures, then you have more access to fatty acids. So from a nutritional standpoint, you could you could inspire greater uh, brain development. Yeah, by the short chain fatty acids, definitely. Um, but then there, you know, you had to get mate selected right from that, and then branch off that way. And so it's just kind of interesting. Well, and we are we are hybrids of hybrids of hybrids, right? So right. So what you know at, at one of the advantages human beings apparently had was is that they frequently mated with each other and other other similar species. So 
Um, that's why we have the DNA of Dennis Silvins, Neanderthals, and uh, other pre pre human hominids that we're we haven't even quite identified yet. So it is all quite interesting. Well, we don't know how it all quite came together, but hey, there's some clues, and maybe one day, maybe not. Yeah, the migra migration and haplotype maps are very complicated. And, of course, you see migration after migration after migration, people moving back and forth and in and out and stuff. Those are some of the interesting things I like, I like to look at because they keep trying to keep this out of Africa concept alive. But it's entirely possible that all humans originated somewhere else because the oldest primate remains so far that we think we're uh, predecessors to to um, humans or modern hominids or modern modern uh, uh, modern uh, monkey groups. Uh, actually, the oldest fossils are from Bulgaria. The oldest human remains are in the Levant. So all the all the people that do that believe in the out of Africa theory is like, well, there must have been more migrations earlier on. But then as the evidence mounts that there's older sources for our genetics outside of Africa, definitely sounds like it's less likely, you know, so, but that's the fun. They just keep digging up new evidence and it keeps take, taking us in new directions. So, Yeah, we'll have to just uh, wait and see. You know, as you always say, things are always seem to be getting older. For sure. For sure. Yeah, we see we see examples of everything from tool making, art, even uh, even weaving fabrics. They keep finding finding fabrics mm -hmm. that are older and older and older. And then we they keep we keep finding out that there was people in the Americas much yeah. earlier than we thought. You know, just even like in the Yucatan Peninsula, I think there was two different groups there prior than what anybody else thought. So I'm not even sure what where the, where they suspect the origin was, but uh, they keep coming up with new fabrics. I was reading an article the other day, and these people were actually making woven fabrics from the bark of oak trees long before they huh. thought anybody was weaving fabric. They just figured everybody's wearing animal skins because why not? We were clearly eating animals all the time and stuff like that. But uh, people were also uh, weaving things out of, you know, stuff like uh, oak, oak tree bark. And then, you know, I don't know if you really get into it. You can read um, about the spirit cave mummy. So the, I think the spirit cave mummy was actually found on um, trying to remember which, which tribe it is, but it's found on tribal ground. But the, but that mummy doesn't genetically isn't related to that tribe, but, since it's on tribal ground, the remains can't be disturbed. But the spirit mm. cave mummy is wrapped in a um, in like a cloth, a blanket or a tunic that's at least nine thousand years old, and it's mm. here in the Americas, right? And then all, all the way over on the east coast, you got the Windover Bog people. So they were clearing land and. Florida, I think it was for a condominium complex. And they started finding bodies, and these bodies were people that were just had died, and they were buried in a bog, and the bog preserved their uh, remains. And those people are also a different type of people that you know they predated what we consider like um, current indigenous people in the United States. So there was probably pockets of people that were here during the Ice Age um, that just blended in with the new people when they arrived, right? So and that's often what we see. We kind of think like, oh, Germans are Germans and Spanish are Spanish and Bulgarians are Bulgarians. But it's not, it wasn't that way. And there weren't really, we didn't have borders like we, like we think of now. And people are migrating all over the place and um, traveling. The people are clearly getting around on the ocean a lot better than we thought. But uh, there's um, there's this. They realize that you know, even though most of North America was covered with this giant ice sheet, there were still areas, particularly along the coast, where 
there was uh um that were habitable right everybody just assumed you know, it was habitable and then now they realize um up in canada i wish i could remember the name of the island but there's an a, there's an area up there where the indigenous people are like oh no 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 like the first people got here you know during the ice age and lived here and they started excavating and sure enough there was people living up there in canada you know which is typically cold to this day there was people during the ice age living there right and then there's the red ochre people you know they spread from europe to the united states and you could trace a lot of it not just through through uh, genetics but also the tool type of tools they made the tools very their burial practices you know their artwork all kinds of stuff the dwellings they left behind you know fish hooks spearheads most of it has to do with eating and you know you, you think about it too if there's if you're on the coast you're gonna run into a lot of a lot of marine mammals you know seals walruses you know stuff like that birds and uh there we ate lots and lots of them and then there's all the shellfish too you could collect but some of these ancient cultures were deep sea fishing long before we thought it was anybody could possibly make fishing line to to catch cod or something like that at a, you know a thousand feet down or whatever it is so now that that they've unearthed uh, some of these burials they're like wow these people had really sophisticated harpoons and fish hooks and fishing line and the plummets the weights that they use to get the get the mm -hmm. line down there so yeah like you said things keep going further and further back people were much more mobile than we thought and most of the mobility was caused by climate change so you live in an area it gets too cold or it get, there's a drought or whatever it is or it happens to your neighbor and your neighbor co comes along and kicks you out because <laughs> you you live in a nicer place than they do and they there's more of them or whatever and they they drive you out and you move on to to new pastures as it were so and of course it's a whole weird thing of you know there's an article that came out and it said oh it looks like uh you know viking viking dna was far more asian than we thought but if you dig into it you find out that all the caucasians came from asia anyways you know and that's why they have six foot mummies in the gobi desert you know it's like because most of the most of the caucasians came from the area of the caucasus mountains not too surprising right and they migrated west into europe so they lived there a long time ago it's kind of hard to say exactly where they lived before that and then you see you know farm farmer settlements popping up in the area with, which is iran you know and even though it's it's considered uh passe or um whatever a lot of that is associated with the Aryan migration and of course that's where countries like iran get their name you know, so when you go to Iran, you see guys with red hair, red hair, bushy beards. You think, huh? Those were the those were probably the, those same people. And those same people moved into southern India and mixed with the population down there, and that's why you have some people in India that are taller and fair haired and lighter eyed, and then people who tend to be shorter and darker. And you know, it's all been going on for, you know at least 40,000 years, right? Probably longer. I mean, the most, the, I, the fully modern human being showed up roughly 40,000 years ago. And that's roughly the time all of a sudden Cro-Magnon Cro shows up seemingly almost out of nowhere. They had a chin, which is typically associated with an agricultural uh, society, but um, I suspect that maybe that there's something else to that. But if you're talk to an anthropologist, they'll say, yeah, people with a pronounced chin, typically they think evolved from an agricultural society. But agriculture didn't really take off until eight to 10,000 years ago, you know, when the, by the, around the, you know, sometime after the megafauna disappeared. But uh, it seems like Cro-Magnon, you're looking at 30, 40,000 years ago. And then there was modern humans before that, but they're not fully modern, right? And somewhere mm -hmm. in there, there's all this mix of 
Dennis Sovins and um, well, on and on. They're discovering new species all the time, right? That we have two two very short sort of hobbit like species now that are are being unearthed and then you know we've seen more and more hey 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 i'm half mexican you're talking about us there just kidding well and maybe and maybe not mm -hmm. and, and maybe they're you know so uh, out of out of the tribes that descended into central and south america one of them being the mexica which is essentially the core population that we think of as the original mexicans there were there was like five or six other bands that gradually moved south and some of them started we know as far north as like utah and uh, probably migrated across the bering strait because during the ice age the land in the bering strait was exposed i think you know and i think a lot of people think it was was an ice bridge i've heard it described that way before but it wasn't uh -huh. actually an ice bridge. It was a giant swath of land that was covered in grass and trees and bushes mm. and animals, right? And so they naturally migrated. Uh, I guess that's, uh, I think it's right. Yeah, that's east into North America, down through Canada, down to the United States. And, and this takes place over thousands of years. They didn't just all get up and walk over in one time, you know? It happened over many, many, many generations, and they moved southward. But there was probably plenty of people already here, and they just mixed mm -hmm. together, right? So there was people coming in from the East Coast. It's quite clear now because uh, if you get into the Clovis first theory, which is another one of those theories that's fallen apart, they, they found s a certain style of stone tool in Clovis, New Mexico, which, of course, is closer to the West Coast than the East Coast. They thought, oh, these populations that came in from Europe across the, the Bering Sea were were these people and then they realized oh man this clovis technology is way more prevalent on the east coast and mm -hmm. so they think that people migrated uh from coast to coast now keep in mind during the ice age the ocean levels are like three to four hundred feet lower so there's a lot more exposed land there's a lot more islands the islands that are there mm -hmm. are bigger right and there's food chains so like people don't have to go that far before they can catch a fish eat a seal you know whatever it is you know harpoon a whale whatever the, whatever their whatever their food was you know it's probably you know, like i said it's probably a lot of marine animals a lot of shellfish and we know they ate a lot of marine animals and shellfish because they left piles of garbage at the habituation sites and many of these habituation sites were seasonal you know so and and many times they've been repopulated over and over again over thousands of years and so you excavate and you find deep piles of shellfish and bones and fish hooks and plummets and spearheads and harpoons and then you know like the red ochre people when that when they died they would cover the the person in the inside of their grave with red ochre which is a mineral red mineral mm -hmm. and you could trace the red ochre people all the way back into into europe and they they managed to come somehow from europe all the way over to um to north america up into canada of course we know the vikings were in in canada and probably followed some of the river inlets into the interior united states you know, you get into evidence like the Kensington rune stone, which was thought to be a fake for a while because the runes that are on it. Anyways, does for anybody who wants to know what a rune is, that's runic writing right there. So the particular dialect of runes that were on the Kensington rune stone had not been identified. Somebody thought they were just a bad forgery, but I believe it was when they started doing the archaeological uh, work at the monasteries in Gotland, which is an island off the coast of Scandinavia. I think it's Scandinavia. Could be, I could be wrong about that. But anyways, they found those exact dialects in those monasteries. So they think that that Kensington runestone is likely to be um, is likely to be real. And of course, I think like um, Scott Walter and stuff like that did work on the actual stone to try and determine how long it had been buried. Um, and I think that was pretty well verified that 
Mackenzie Turner. So it's not it's not hard to believe that people that come all the way across the ocean can follow the rivers inland, right? Which is exactly what they right. did. <laughs> so so now, like you said, things keep get, going back further and further in time. People's ability to build boats, navigate. People's ability to weave cloth, make artwork, carve stone. And we even see pockets of early metallurgy and stuff like that. All you have to do is look at the photographs of Gobekli Tepe and see the stonework on those pillars. And you're like, wow, that was some really sophisticated artwork for what is, I think, Gobekli Tepe somewhere in that range between a nine and 12,000 years ago. And there's more primitive uh, structures not that far away. So there was people that were already building stuff sort of like that, not quite as well. And then you get to Gobekli Tepe and they've kind of perfected it and made it bigger. And, it, you know, the problem they had was they built these circular circular uh, sort of structures in in low areas they have these big sandstone pillars that are carved with animals and everything and then they built their homes on the hillsides above it and what happened was the slopes started sliding into their their structures and so they build another set of walls inside these circular structures to try and hold it back and eventually that would fail after a few generations and so they wound up just burying the whole thing because they just couldn't keep the the slopes and, and when they first mm -hmm. found it everybody thought oh this place was intentionally buried to protect it or something like that it was, it was sacred and people talked about it being a temple or you know a religious center or whatever nobody really knows exactly what it was um and it wasn't buried intentionally but probably because of slope failures and not because of aliens attacking or anything like that <laughs> sorry all you ancient aliens i know <laughs> I agree that the whole ancient alien angle is fascinating, but it's it's apparently not the only explanation for everything. <laughs> not just aliens. Not just I love that meme. Right. Yeah. It was aliens, right? Yeah. So anyway, kind of well, I I always appreciate Tom's history lessons because they're truly history lessons. Like, yeah, it's quite well. You know, always I'm mind bending. I'm completely fascinated by these things and, and then the information comes out faster than I can ever keep up with, but it's amazing how it all seems to tie together. Right. And it's like, you know, and, and I think, I think uh, a lot of people should, should take from it that, you know, we, we think about people from different countries or people, of different languages or skin colors or uh hairstyles or whatever is being so different different religions but the truth is we're all related and we our, our genes have been mixed and remixed and remixed over and over again so we're really really not that different we're just we just belong to different cultures and different subcultures and sub subcultures you know i mean the sub the subculture in on my street in my town is different from the one a few blocks away right it's really that different yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we won't get into it, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, m more or less, you know, we're certainly more similar than not, and any preservation of one side or the other is just kind of silly if you actually know the history, and it's, it's really weird that the first people to do carnivore weren't, like, anthropologists, you know, it just didn't dawn on them that, hey, they're eating a lot of meat. Like what's up here? You know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. kind of kind of funny. It didn't come from the. It came from a dentist, kind of. Yeah, from what's today Price's research. Yeah, modern. You know, you you had uh, Val uh, Hemison. I totally butchered that. Oh, uh, Val Hilmer uh, Stephenson. Yeah. Yeah, Val Hilmer Stephenson. Uh -huh. You know, a, a generation before him, but not too far before him. Uh, just, but he he was just out talking to locals. He just kind of found himself in a, with a tribe that wasn't eating anything but meat. You know, it didn't even occur to him before that. So it's just, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So you figure if people, you know, I think the early cultivation of wheat starts in the Levant, something like nine thousand years ago. We're not really sure. And then, you know. 
this is not too long after the time of the extinction of the megafauna. So um, as I understand it, and I think the most viable theory, and I know that there's lots of old textbooks and people who read them who who argue with this, but the the mammoths, the mastodons, three-toed sloths, woolly rhinos, and all those giant animals were probably, their end probably started when um, a large meteor struck the Greenland ice sheet. Um, it ejected a great deal of material into the atmosphere. Some of probably all, all the way back out into outer space. And of course, it, um, that amount of kinetic energy is going to release a lot of heat and melt a lot of ice throw boulders all over the place but somewhere in there kicked off a warming period um you see evidence of you know herds of mammoths being being essentially crushed by a tidal wave of debris and water and piled up and i don't know a lot of early people said oh humans they came along and wiped out all these all these mammoths thousands and thousands and thousands they just wiped them out and piled them up it you know it's like and, and the thing is, when you look at the the bones, I mean, these these mammoths have like broken leg bones and st stuff like that, you know, catastrophic uh, blunt force injuries and stuff like that. So I don't know how prehistoric humans would have done all that and piled them up and then let them freeze in the permafrost. It seems a lot more like they were hit by tidal waves of flood material, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, anyways, all that evidence is there. And then somewhere they, they started to die out because things started warming up. Patches of them survived. There's even little pygmy uh, uh, mammoths that were trapped on an island that, you know, as their habitat was small, they got smaller and smaller. And they were some of the last ones to go extinct. But, of course, we still have elephants, African and um, Asian elephants or Indian elephants, you know, which are close cousins. You know, they're just not as hairy, typically a little bit smaller. But um, the ones more adapted to colder climate are gone. It's, um, you know, they these animals typically graze on vast gr grasslands. Uh, elephants and mammoth stuff are known to kill trees. I know for the tree huggers out there, it's hard to hard to imagine an ele beautiful elephant killing a tree, but a full-grown elephant can trample up to... 1600 trees a year or something like that if i remember correctly because they like grassland and savanna and that's why forests didn't take over the planet right this is you know these animals created savannas where they ate grass you know and and mm. so did the other the other big animals you know and uh so you're saying if you're gonna do rotational organic farming you need at least one elephant <laughs> some ducks mm. some geese some cow pigs and chickens to do it right yeah and I, I'm, I'm leaning towards uh the larger breeds i'd like to see the mega chickens come back because you know if i'm going to eat a thigh i don't want to have to eat 20 of them for one meal i'm just saying <laughs> how much how big pay? was a mega chicken what was the mega chicken I feel like I've heard it, but I don't remember the. You know, there's this. I don't. I don't know. I don't know about the mega chicken, but it's probably something like an ostrich or a emu oh, or something. Right. But there were birds that were the once the bony tooth classification. The uh, um, storis. I'm not going to be able to remember it. But anyways, these those guys had like 21 foot wingspans. Right, they'd be like five or seven feet tall or some crap. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we saw we saw birds around here that are three or four feet tall. The they're like the egrets and the cranes and stuff. I'm not even sure which one they are, but I walked up on one one day. I was I was out in the river bottom and it came around. So it's, it's like something out of like a fairy tale movie where you walk you're walking under the trees and it's all dark, and then come around the corner and the light's shining down on this pond that's surrounded, and there's this giant white bird, you know, the long beak, you know, the long ways and He's got to be at least three and a half feet tall. And he just turns his head slowly and it looks at me. And then he puts his wings up one time and he just disappears through the canopy. And I was like, wow. <laughs> if he was any bigger, he'd be in trouble. 
he's so stealthy and quiet too he just swooped out of there like just shot up through the trees like with one one movement of his wings i couldn't believe it so death from above for sure you know we know like eagles and stuff like that they'll kill wolves when they're competing for food so you know they're very dangerous they can be very dangerous and probably lucky they're not here anymore <laughs> So th there is there is some uh, mythology it might be true about um, birds, large birds preying on pygmies or tiny people. Um, so yeah, our, our babies. Stealing babies, right? Yeah. They don't bring them back, though. <laughs> they certainly. They just eat them. So. Well, I think that's where the stork myth comes from. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe all that's true. Maybe they're just, uh, you know, the. Modern humans, including the little ones, overlapped. I mean, uh, I forget what it is. Uh, Florencia, the 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 very small people that they found probably 10, 15 years ago. Nobody thought there mm -hmm. was little hobbit guys running around and you know this in contemporary with modern man, fully modern man. But now there's two species of them. So yeah, maybe Wait, there did. were there were legit like dwarf species of humans yeah, is that what you're saying yeah 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 yeah. they're real they found they found their bones now so and 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 in a cave with giant birds too huh yeah so um i think it's off god I don't, i'm not gonna look it up right now because i'll go down a wormhole but, or but like were they like stout or were they like i'm just trying to picture uh, I'm trying I think not were, to be too Hollywood about it. You know I mean? Like, how did was, they survive? I think they were uh, fairly slightly built. Hmm. Uh, there, but like I said, there's two species, and the newer species I don't know that much about. You know, and I, I don't know if you follow, but have you, you, you seen the stories about Dragon Man? I don't think so. No, so, at least not. If I remember correctly, during the Japanese occupation in China, I think it was. Some guys digging a well for the Japanese were digging and they found the skull. And they're like, what is this? Because it kind of looks human, but it's kind of freaky looking. And they uh -huh. hit it. And then so and so's grandpa's on his deathbed. He's like, hey, you got to go retrieve that skull and take it to the scientists of the museum or whatever. You know, it's, we buried it during the war and you got to go get it. So retrieve this thing. And some people think it's Dennis Obin and some people think it's, it's, uh, a new a new uh hominid a new human like creature so uh mm -hmm. they call him dragon man because it was found along the dragon river so so anyways, there's new species popping up all the time the 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 old sort of uh graphic of like a monkey turning into an ape turning into a caveman turning into modern human is that very linear sort of thing has kind of all gone to hell it's more like this crazy wild bush of all these different species popping up and we just happen to be the last ones but we also interbred with a lot of them so we carry a lot of their genes and um you know, some of the genes we got from, you know, Neanderthals might have helped us survive because they were very, they had large brains, they're very burly and strong. But some of their genes might also be the genes that cause uh, autoimmune diseases. So it's hard to say. And some of the genes from the Denisovans, uh, they're the ones that allow people like the Sherpa to climb to high altitudes without their blood thickening. You know, without yeah. severe altitude sickness. So, so anyways, there's all kinds of of exchange of genes that are both advantages and disadvantages, but mostly advantages because that's what survives, right? So, but it's all based on eating meat. These people weren't farmers, right? They weren't farmers. We came down out of the trees, started eating leftovers in the savanna, became hunters, developed a shoulder, the eyes, the hips, to both hunt on land and in the water. And again, one of my favorite questions is like, what's worse, carbohydrates or vegetable oil? The other one is, do we just come down out of the trees and develop on the savannas? Or are we aquatic apes? Great question. Great discussion. Great argument. Great evidence from both sides. 
probably be a long probably won't even we we'll probably won't even figure that out in our lifetimes but i like the discussion i don't feel like anybody really needs to stay in one camp or the other you know yeah I think- although i will say i i i'm pretty firmly stuck in aquatic ape theory i'll have to say that and the uh terrence mckenna smoky ape theory as well so there you go well i, I was in my article. camps here you go the uh i read an article this morning or yesterday and they were saying that the human ear bone the little bone in the ear actually mm-hmm. is a descendant of fish gills so there you go oh wow that's interesting well i Why? knew it had to do with buoyancy like our ears and the space between our brain and all that has to do with buoyancy and our balance you know but like because the thing is is that not only to it we can balance in water like we don't get dizzy or disoriented in water, which is extremely strange if you think about it. Well, right. So we can do that. We can hold our breath. None of the other primates can hold their breath. That's why they can't talk. You can teach a gorilla a thousand words, but they can never enunciate it because they can't control their breath and they don't have a descended larynx. And a descended larynx is very rare in nature. I think there's... It, for a long time, I thought humans were the only ones that had it, but then there's like a deer or something that has it. Plus, uh, we lost a lot of body hair, or at least most of us. My friend was telling me about a guy she was dating. Was all that. Maybe, maybe, maybe not all of us, but um, uh, uh, we lost a lot of body hair. We got grew big brains. We have more body fat than the other primates, unless you lock them up in a zoo and feed them junk food. And uh-huh. um, you know, we make tools. We 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 take tool making to a whole new level. You know, even the way little little infants play, and the way they pick up and use things, quickly surpasses anything you see any other any other primate. So, well, we have the biggest brain and the most fat. So there you go. Well, and of course, there are animals that have bigger brains than us, but they don't have thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> right. They, they well, you don't have lyrics for language either. They don't have complex language like us. Although, you know, whales, you know, there's an argument for whales and dolphins and those those mammals. So maybe we are aquatic apes, you know. I just see too much evidence for us for like the foundations of what makes us good in the water building into new foundations that make us good on land. Well, the water's a good place. It be, would have been really hard to do that backwards, I feel like. Yeah, so, and, and the, the water's a good place to find a lot of omega-3 fatty acid, right? Back to the fatty right. acid thing, right? To find it in aquatic animals, fish. And stuff. it's just so much easier to hunt water animals than, you know, you could grab a sea urchin off the bottom, clams, barnacles, a lobster you could probably just go down there and grab from the well, there's, back. There's crabs and, and lobsters, you know, all over the place, right? Right. And yeah. they're not that hard to hunt, really. I mean, that was probably one of the first things we quote unquote hunted. We just made traps, right? I don't know if there's been evidence for that, but I would imagine we've been trap making for those animals for possibly fifty plus thousand years. I don't know about those types of traps, but humans started building giant traps for land animals and they also do them on the shore for fish they're generally called kites and so like when the tide would come in there would be like a wall embankment sort of thing and the tide would come in the fish would go over this little wall and as the tide go back out they'd get trapped just walk Mm -hmm. walk down to the shore and then there's another thing called a weir so you get in a, a a stream or a river or something and you start building a a pond in the water so and the water goes over the top edge but a lot of the fish get trapped as they hit the wall in this little ponded area and then it's easy to fish and oh yeah i did that with my dad up in the azusa canyon we did that one time there you go yeah so there's that and there's different arrangements that have been found i think that was done with sticks and stuff to sort of funnel fish into a cavity so they'd go in there and then have trouble getting out so and then you do that. That would be land. interesting. Sorry. On land, on land, it's basically like you create like a canyon and you drive 
you drive a herd of gazelle or whatever into a funnel and then they're trapped in an, in an area where it's easy to hunt them. So try to go ahead. Right. Well, I was going to say, it'd be interesting to know when like weaving, when we had the ability to weave, because, you know, if we could weave a basket out of some wood and you can make like a water trap for like crab. And I don't think we know exactly when we were able to start weaving even before weaving clothes. Yeah, so the thing I think the thing there is is because when you make a fish hook out of bone or stone or a harpoon or a plummet, the material are made out of lasts a long time. Because of course things right. like wood and cloth fiber, they decay easily, so it's kind of hard to tell. Right, exactly. Well, which is, you know, the human poop theory that we ate a bunch of plants because that's what they see in the feces record, right? And yeah, like, but that only that was done on live people, right? So when you look at yeah. copper lights or cooper lights, what do you whatever you call it from ancient times, then you realize we eat very little plant. Generally yeah. less than less than twenty percent, sometimes zero percent, often zero percent came from plants. So well, because there's not nothing left. I mean, once we're digested, if we I could go to the dog park and drop one. And it'd be gone in a couple of days. <laughs> Please. Yeah, it should be my car, car carnivore experiment. <laughs> there you go. Hopefully right. not after having the uh, pork uh, beef mix burgers. Cause I might be out there for a while. <laughs> All right then. On that note, maybe we ought to wrap it up. We should thank everybody Sounds good. for watching, listening, leave us your comments. Let us know. Let us know your favorite fatty acid or favorite source for fatty acid, your favorite ancient ancient archaeological slash uh, anthropological topic. And uh, we appreciate all the support. In the comments, are you team from the trees or team ape uh, from, water ape from theory? From the trees or from the seas? From the trees or from the seas? Put it on the sea comments. I want to see who wins. Are you an aquatic ape fan or are you a Savannah fan? Savannah fan? Let us know. Let yeah. us know which way you go. <laughs> Either way, they ate a lot of meat. For sure. So, uh, yeah, we appreciate anybody who leaves us a comment, helps us grow the channel, pass the links on, hits the like buttons, get subscribed. Make sure you get the alerts. And until next time, Eat some meat. Eat some meat. Feel better. Feel better. Whatever you do. And whatever you do. Don't fall down don't the fiber fall hole. Down the fiber hole. Carb hole. Carb hole.